All right, we're back to discuss Fiertz identities, uh, which are going to be quite useful for us in looking at various supersymmetric field theories in the weeks to come. We're going to need these identities to show the closure of the supersymmetry algebra. So let's get started. Fiertz identities. And again, these are going to be important for verifying the closure of the supersymmetry algebra. And uh, to discuss these identities, we're going to need a slightly more abstract viewpoint than we've used so far uh, with these gamma matrices and spinners. So up to this point, I've been talking about the gamma matrices as operators acting on the space of spinners. And now I want to think about the gamma matrices themselves as being basis elements in some larger vector space. So I want to think about the space spanned by the gamma mu. And we'll write that in the following way. So I'm going to have a, a generalized index capital gamma which will indicate that this gamma matrix is one of the following options. It might be the identity, it might be the gamma 5 matrix, it might be gamma mu, it might be gamma mu times gamma 5, it might be gamma mu nu, anti-symmetrized over the indices mu nu, it might be gamma mu nu times gamma 5, and so forth. And again, gamma here is a generalized index, and when I write this gamma mu nu lambda dot dot dot, I have in mind that it's an anti-symmetrized product of that number of gamma matrices. So gamma mu, gamma nu, gamma lambda, dot, dot, dot. So we already saw an example of that. We saw the gamma mu nu matrix, which I can think of as one half gamma mu, gamma nu minus gamma nu, gamma mu. Very good. So I want to think about these gamma matrices with this generalized index as a basis of a vector space. So we could, we could write then a general element in this space in this space as a sum over all of these gamma matrices with some coefficients, C sub gamma, gamma sub capital gamma. And we can even give it an inner product, but when we have these matrices, a nice inner product to use is often the trace, so that's what we'll use. We'll have an inner product which is M1, M2, which we define to be the trace of M1 dagger M2. So my first claim there are precisely, there are precisely enough gammas to represent any matrix, any 2 to the floor d over 2 by 2 to the floor d over 2 uh, matrix. So, you know, that floor d over 2 function, that's the size of the Dirac representation for the Clifford algebra. So in general, these gamma matrices are, you know, that wide by that deep. And I claim with this uh, long list of these gamma matrices, I'm able to give you anything you like in that in that set of matrices. So let's just see how that works. Let's let's talk about, uh, for example, d equals 4. In four dimensions, we have 4 by 4 matrices. The Dirac representation is uh, four-dimensional. And again, that's not because space-time is four-dimensional. So what, what, ma what matrices do we have? Well, we have the identity. There's one of those. We have a gamma 5 matrix. There's one of those. We have a gamma mu matrix. There's the d of those. Actually, there's four of those since I'm in four dimensions. How about gamma mu times gamma five? Well, again, I've got four of those. And then let's think about gamma mu nu. So that's anti-symmetrized indices, mu and nu. So that's going to give uh, four times three over two. And I sum that all up. What do I get? Well, one plus one plus four plus four, that's 10. And then four times three over two is six. So altogether, I should get 16 here. But that's precisely the right number, right? Because I've got a four by four matrix. Four times four is also 16. And you might wonder then, well, what about these other gamma matrices where I have yet more indices? Uh, well, let's think about that for a minute. They must be redundant, and, and indeed they are. So you might ask, what about, you know, the gamma, gamma mu nu? Well, let's think about that. So if I took, for example, gamma, gamma two, three, well, since the gamma five matrix is a product of all the other gamma matrices, I can contract the gamma 2 and the gamma 3 together to get 1 in that product, and I'll see that up to a sign anyway, up to a sign, this has got to be plus or minus gamma 0, 1. And similarly, if you were to ask, say, about gamma uh, mu nu lambda, why isn't that in my list? Well, how about gamma 0, 1, 2, for instance? Well, that I could write as uh, up to a sign again as gamma gamma 3 because gamma 3 will kill the gamma 3 inside the gamma 5 matrix and leave gamma 0, gamma 1, gamma 2. So they're not, these extra guys are not linearly independent. And I'll leave it as an exercise for you to think about the general dimensional case. 
but you should be able to convince yourself that in any dimension, even or odd, remember in the uh, odd dimensions I don't have the gamma 5 matrix, that the counting will work out. Okay, I've got one more claim here, which I'm not going to completely establish. I'll just show you a little bit towards it, a further claim, uh, that uh, this the set of gamma matrices provide an orthogonal basis. They're not going to be orthonormal. There's a sign that gets in the way of them being strictly orthonormal, but they will be orthogonal. So that if I, you know, if I take any of them, the claim is if I take any gamma gamma and gamma gamma prime, there's going to be some trace of gamma gamma Hermitian conjugate, gamma gamma prime, that this is going to be uh, zero if gamma is not equal to gamma prime. So one way of, of, of trying to establish this, that is we should start thinking about the traces of all of these gamma matrices. So let's let's do that. Let's start with the simplest one. Let's start with the identity inner product with gamma mu. So that's just trace of gamma mu. That must be zero. Let's see. So I could write as a trick, we'll, we'll multiply that by, by the uh, Minkowski tensor, and uh, then we'll use the anti-commutation relations to move the Minkowski tensor inside the trace. We can write that as anti-commutator gamma mu gamma nu, and then gamma lambda. We'll write that out. So that's trace gamma mu gamma nu gamma lambda plus gamma nu gamma mu gamma lambda. And now I'll use cyclicity of the trace uh, to cycle the gamma matrices through. So the first term I'll leave alone, but the, uh, the second term, what I want to do is I want to cycle the gamma mu to the front. So I'll, put, I'll write it as gamma mu gamma lambda gamma nu, and this is by cyclicity of the trace. And now the last two terms I can recognize as an anti-commutator, so I can write this as trace of gamma mu, anti-commutator gamma nu, gamma lambda, and then I'll pull out the Minkowski tensor, eta nu lambda, trace of gamma mu. So what did all this gymnastics grant me? It's sort of not clear exactly how, how this was how this was going to help, but now, now, we, now we can see, what we see is we're going to choose uh, mu equals nu, and not equal to lambda. So what is the, all this by this? So what we see, we see if in the first Minkowski tensor, because mu is equal to nu, this is not equal to zero. And then the last Minkowski tensor, we see that because nu is not equal to lambda, this is equal to zero. And so we seem to have a contradiction, right? The only way for this to happen is for a uh, trace of gamma lambda to be zero. And so we've proved that the trace of a single uh, gamma matrix is zero. So I'll leave as an exercise for you to show the trace of uh, arbitrary one of these gamma matrices is also zero, provided I don't add too many indices. I need to keep the indices between zero and D, otherwise it, it's, it's no longer true. So there's a slightly more general of the version I gave you for the single gamma matrix that should, that should work here. And with a little more thought, you should be able to convince yourself of the earlier statement that the set of these gamma matrices forms an orthogonal basis. Okay, so now given a complete and orthogonal basis, I can write a decomposition of the identity. Let's think a little bit about how this works in, in a quantum mechanics context. So there you might have some identity operator in a Hilbert space, and you have a bunch of states which form a complete basis. And what you can do is if they're uh, in addition to an orthogonal basis, you can write a decomposition of the identity as some number, and then these brawn kets of your, uh, your, your, complete, your complete basis set. And if it was an orthonormal basis, all those C size, those numbers would all be one. But because we haven't made it orthonormal, because all of these size don't have unit length, we need to have a little bit of extra freedom here. And, and what, how does this work? Well, you can act with psi on, uh, on both sides. Well, let's call it psi prime, and you'll see from this then that uh, psi prime is equal to c psi prime, psi prime, psi prime, psi prime. And then in order for this to be true, we need that this, this normalization, uh, sorry, this, this coefficient c psi has to be equal to uh, one over the inner product of these two states, the inner product of psi prime with itself. So I want to you know, generalize this intuition that I hope you have from linear algebra or quantum mechanics uh, to the current case where we're working a little bit more abstractly with this basis of gamma matrices. So in our case, the psi are these gamma matrices with this generalized index capital gamma. And in our case, this resolution of the identity, if I dress it up with the spinner indices, I can write in, in a slightly fancier form uh, in this way. I have a 
these chronic or delta functions. This is acting as my identity operator. Some on my gamma matrices, some constant that we have to determine, and then my, uh, my two states, my bra and cat that I had on the previous slide. And let's include those spinner indices. Now, the careful among you might note that I've, I've kind of dropped here a Hermitian conjugation. Um, and I should, I should maybe have been more careful, but let's just note that this Hermitian conjugation in the definition of the inner product, it produces at most a sign when acting on these, uh, these gamma matrices. And so we can, we can absorb it in the normalization or this, 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 uh, this number C gamma. Okay, so the next step, we want to fix this, this, these coefficients. To fix the C gamma, what do we do? Let's uh, multiply both sides by one of our states, by which I mean one of our gamma, gamma matrices by, uh, let's take uh, gamma with a gamma prime generalized index, beta gamma, too many gammas floating around. Apologize for the notation. And so from this, we learn what? We learn that uh, gamma gamma prime alpha delta, having contracted those indices with the Kronecker delta functions, that's the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, I've got a sum over gamma, C gamma. I'm gonna take the trace. That's how I do the inner product, right? So I'm gonna get a trace of gamma gamma prime and gamma gamma. And then finally, I have gamma gamma alpha delta. Now, this sum is going to uh, vanish for every term except uh, the, the term where gamma is equal to gamma prime, where the generalized index gamma is equal to the generalized index gamma prime. So this sum is going to reduce to C gamma prime trace gamma gamma prime gamma gamma prime gamma gamma alpha delta. And so I'm going to need to fix uh, that, that constant so that this product here is equal to 1. Right, so let's, let's see what, how that trace evaluates on, on the next page. So we need to compute trace of gamma, 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 gamma. And I claim, I claim this is the trace of the identity up to a sign. Now each of these gamma matrices is a product of the, the simpler gamma matrices, the gamma mu's. And each one of those gamma mu's appears exactly the same number of times in each of these gammas. And so, you know, I can commute them through each other until they touch and then set them equal to one or minus one and eliminate them. And so when I simplify this trace, the only thing I can get out at the end of the day is plus or minus the identity. Every gamma mu appears exactly twice. And now that trace, well, that, that identity matrix, it has the size of the Dirac representation, which is this power of two. So I'm gonna get plus or minus two to the floor of D over two. And so from this, I learned that my, my coefficient C gamma is plus or minus one over two to this funny power, which is the size of the, of the gamma matrices. And then to actually fix the plus or minus, uh, we have to look case by case, unfortunately. Or at least that's the way I do it. Uh, you're, 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 at the end of the day, you're working in four dimensions and you've got to look at the 4D gamma matrices. You're looking at three dimensions. You've got to look at the 3D ones and fix the signs of all these, uh, all these traces. So let's, let's give this plus or minus sign a name. Let's, uh, let's call it minus one to the capital gamma. So it's going to depend on that, on that gamma matrix, the generalized index of that gamma matrix. So we're finally ready to state the, the Fiertz identities. We've got to, you know, put the spinners back. And so Fiertz identities, they're often written for products of, of three or four spinners. Um, so let's write down, let's write down three of them. Let's look at lambda bar, psi, chi alpha. And I claim I can write that as lambda bar gamma, psi delta, chi beta, and then this Kronecker delta function business I had in the Fiertz identities, delta alpha beta and delta delta gamma. Now this product I can replace uh, with this decomposition over my, over my basis. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to write that as minus, I'll tell you why that minus sign is, in, is there in a moment, sum over my gamma matrices that coefficient whose value we talked about on the previous slide, lambda bar gamma, gamma generalized index gamma, gamma beta, chi beta, and then I have a gamma generalized index gamma, alpha delta, psi delta. Great. And now the minus sign, where did the minus sign come from? Well, if you notice, when I went from the first line here to the second line here, I switched the position of psi and chi. And because they're Grassmann valued, when I make that switch, I've got to include a sign. 
So now let's write that in a little bit more detail. So I've got my minus one from anti-commuting the spinners. I've got this coefficient c gamma, which now I'll expand a little bit. I'll put in the factor of two and leave the minus one inside the sum, the minus one to the gamma. And now the rest of this I can write as lambda bar gamma gamma chi and then gamma gamma psi alpha. So that's sort of the, the general form of the Fiertz identities. And they're going to look slightly different in each dimension because in each dimension we're going to have a slightly different set of these uh, gamma matrices that span our basis. As we go higher and higher in dimension, we're going to have more and more of these gamma matrices. The Fiertz identities become more and more complicated. Uh, but fortunately, in the low dimensions we're interested in, things are fairly simple. In two, three, and four dimensions, there's not more than three or four terms ever. So for example, in, in, in d equals three, I could write lambda bar psi chi alpha. There's just two terms, in fact. I'm going to have minus a half lambda bar chi psi alpha. So that's the identity matrix in my basis. And then there's another term, minus a half lambda bar gamma mu chi, and then gamma mu psi alpha. So there's, in fact, just two terms in three dimensions. And, you know, this gamma mu nu guy would be linearly dependent on the other gammas. There's no gamma 5 in three dimensions, so I don't have to worry about that. So they're just, just these two terms. And, and in fact, things are often even simpler for what we're going to do. You know, we're often going to be worried about Majorana spinners. Sometimes some of these spinners are going to be the same. So, for example, if it happened that lambda was equal to chi, and these were also all Majorana spinners, then then in this case, lambda gamma mu lambda would be zero by one of these Majorana flip identities uh, that I wrote before. And the only thing left here would be the first term. And so you, you'd find that lambda bar psi lambda alpha is minus a half lambda bar lambda psi alpha in this, in this further case, if, if they were Majorana and, and, uh, and lambda is equal to chi. So that's just to give you a flavor of, of, of this, uh, of how these Fiertz identities work. We'll use uh, some analogs of these in the four-dimensional case in some lectures to come. Uh, so that's it for the official part of the curriculum this week. I have one more lecture I want to give about this two-component formalism or this vial formalism, uh, and we'll talk about that next time, and that will bring the week's lectures uh, to a close.